Praise the Lamb of God, beloved. We're glad to be able to be with you one more time in the name, above every other name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Dr. Lyle Lee, and we are studying a series on how to read a Bible. Now, there are seven methods or seven ways in which a person should learn how to read a Bible. We've already completed the program on literal translation. The second method on how to read a Bible is metaphorically. And that's what we're going to study tonight, is how to read a Bible in metaphors. If you don't know metaphors, then you will not be able to read a Bible. The literal translation is not the only way in which the Bible was written or composed. Metaphors are all throughout the Word of God. It begins on the first day of creation. The very first day of creation begins with a metaphor. Now, metaphors are all throughout the Psalms. They're used in Psalms. They're used in the major minor prophets. They're used in um, basically the entire word. Every parable Jesus spoke, there was metaphors involved. The entire book of Revelation is a book of metaphors. And again, the best way for a Bible to be interpreted is by the Bible. Once you learn a metaphor, you can use a metaphor to interpret a metaphor. In other words, as I study the Bible and I use the word light, the word light in metaphors means the gospel. It means the knowledge of God that Jesus taught. So as you study the first day of creation, we realize on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light, which means gospel. What it means is what Jesus was going to preach was created on the first day of creation. The gospel was the light that God created. Now, I am not the one that interpreted that particular revelation. It wasn't me that had discovered that. It was the Apostle Paul. Paul stated this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. He said, on the first day of creation, when God said, let there be light, it was the gospel. It was the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What Jesus preached and what Jesus taught. And so as you realize the light is the gospel, then the sayings of Christ, when, when the Lord Jesus said, walk in the light, or the Apostle John in 1 John 1, verses 5 to 7, walk in the light, and you'll have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. So to walk in the light, it means to walk in the knowledge of God that Jesus taught in the gospel. That's the light. Now we realize that God dwells in light. So what does God dwell in? The knowledge of the gospel. There is no darkness in God. That's a metaphor. Means God never thinks of evil or satanic things. What we consider light to be as the gospel, it's very imperative that you use the metaphor to interpret other sayings of the Bible. So once you learn a metaphor, it's like learning a language. The metaphor always remains the same except some particular metaphors like the word tree. As you study your Bible, now we're going to read Psalms 1.1. And God said, we are to meditate on the Bible day and night, and we as Christians, now it was spoken during the Old Testament, so for the Jew, as a Jew, they had to meditate on the law, which was the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the law of God. They meditate on the law day and night, they're like a tree. There it is, the metaphor. So, as Christians, we meditate on the law of God, the Ten Commandments written in the heart. And we're like a tree planted by the rivers of living water or water. Now, that's another metaphor. I don't look like a tree, but the Bible calls me a tree. 
And in John 15, Jesus calls me a branch. These are metaphors, beloved. You need to learn metaphors to read the Bible. So in Psalms 1, because I'm a tree, I'm planted by water. So I'm going to read for you Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to look at this particular metaphor for a minute. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, 26, in a metaphor. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Here Paul calls water the Bible or the word of God. So in Psalms 1, the tree planted by the water is really a Christian that's meditating on the word. This is the water. And then as we draw the water from the Bible, it means that in our season, our leaf will not wither. Now, these are metaphors. What is your season as a Christian? Your wife leaves you. Your husband's running around. Your children are on drugs. Your boss just fired you. You don't have any money in the bank. You've come to a season. You found out you have a terminal Disease, you're in a season. In your season, your leaf will not wither. Again, a metaphor. The leaf of a tree means the religion of the tree. So in your case or my case, as Christians, our leaf is our religion, which is the gospel. It will not fail us when we come into our season, our test, our trial, our valley, when we're going through our test, our religion will stand the season. It will not fade away. It will not wither. And so our religion will be able to go through the fires and the trials and the valleys. And then it makes a promise there. Whatever we put our hand to, God will bless it. So it doesn't matter as a Christian, whatever you do for a business... You can do any business you want as long as it's not a business of sin. Any type of business and God will bless whatever you put your hand to. Any athletics, artistry, it doesn't matter what you get involved in. School, God will bless everything you put your hand to. As long as you're a tree, you meet the condition. You're a tree planted by the rivers of water. Then, because you met the condition... Whatever you put your hand to, God will prosper it. It's a powerful uh, promise, beloved. It's a conditional promise, but a powerful promise for those that understand metaphors. And they're looking for blessings from the Bible. Now we realize an example. Jesus said in Matthew 24 concerning the end times, or what's better known as eschatology, consider the fig tree. That's Israel. This is a metaphor. Jesus is saying, if you want to learn about the end times, look at Israel. Consider the fig tree. When its leaf is yet tender, that means when Israel goes back to their religion, because the leaf means the religion. So as I study that, Matthew 24, the saying of Christ, and the fig tree, and the leaf being tender, I realize the only way that Israel will be able to practice their religion is according to the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel 9, 27, when the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel and allows them to animal sacrifice again according to their law of Moses. You see, beloved, for the last 2,000 years, the Jews have not been animal sacrificing since their temple was torn down in the year 70 A.D., now, from that time, there's been no animal sacrifice. But Israel will go back to animal sacrificing. Their leaf will be tender, and they will go back to sacrificing animals, according to Matthew 24, before Jesus returns. And you must realize the prophecy and metaphor, or you'll think, like many people have predicted, Jesus can come tomorrow, and it will not happen. Unless the prophecies come to pass, there will be no second coming of Christ. In this case, Matthew 24, in metaphors, Israel must go back to animal sacrificing. 
And they cannot do that until the Antichrist permits them to in a seven-year covenant. So that's why Jesus said, consider Israel. Look at the fig tree. So for those of you that are looking for Jesus to appear tomorrow, or you think the second coming of Christ could happen next month, or it could happen this year, then ask yourself the question, has Israel signed a seven-year peace treaty? Are they sacrificing animals yet? If they're not, there cannot be a second coming of Christ. We must follow the metaphors that are the prophecies that tell us about eschatology, the second coming of Christ, the end times. Now, as we study our Bible in metaphors, we realize that all of the parables that Jesus spoke were filled with metaphors. If you cannot understand metaphors, you will not understand any parable. The reason is some of the parables are interpreted and some of them are not. There is no interpretation of many parables in the Bible. Therefore, you have to learn what the parable is in order to... To understand that parable, you have to learn the metaphor. Now remember, a parable is nothing more than a parallel truth concerning the real gospel. Every parable must be able to fit into the real gospel. Now I know that the churches teach all kinds of fractions, schisms of the gospel of Jesus Christ, divisions. But if you check the parables, the parables will not fit into what they call the gospel. So do they have the true gospel? Well, if the parable doesn't fit, they do not. We must put all parables into whatever we think the gospel is. An example. If you study the gospel and you think Christians go to hell once they backslide, Christians lose their salvation. Well, you haven't put the parable into your gospel. And so in your denomination, they don't understand the parables. They don't interpret the metaphors. Listen to Luke 15. Jesus said, There was a man that had a hundred sheep and one went astray. Now we're dealing with metaphors. The sheep is a Christian. The Christian backslid. When the shepherd, which could be a pastor or it could be Jesus himself, caught up to the sheep. The sheep was gone by the wayside. The sheep was not in the fold, wasn't fellowshipping with other Christians. So that Christian was so backslidden, he's into the things of the world. Now notice when the shepherd caught up to it, the sheep was still a sheep. You see, in your denomination, if Christians lose their salvation when they backslide, then the sheep became a goat. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught when the sheep backslides, it remains a sheep. It cannot turn into a goat. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Never. But they can lose the salvation of their soul, because you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. But when you get born again, it's only your spirit that's born again, not your soul, not your body. So in the parables, the metaphors teach you the true gospel. Again, when you study Luke 15, the three parables that are there, the coin that was lost in the house, then you realize, if you read that, it's a metaphor. The coin is really a Christian lost in the house, which is a metaphor for the church of Jesus Christ. So you've got Christians going to church that are lost in the church. Now, they're Christians, so meaning they're saved. They're a coin. They're saved. When they get lost in the house... They're not um, gone to becoming a child of the devil, but they have lost the salvation of their soul. Like the sheep that went astray, the statement was made, he was lost and he was a sinner. There's joy in heaven over one sinner. So although he's called a sheep, he's also called a sinner and he's called lost at the same time. The same with the coin. Jesus taught the coin was still a coin, so the Christian remains a Christian, even though they're backslidden, but they're lost. They're lost right in the house of God. That's why the church is commanded to take a broom, move the dust and the dirt, which is a metaphor for sin. So in the church, we preach against sin, even to our brethren, because some of them are living in sin. 
So we want them to repent so that their soul will be saved. This is in the literal translation in James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. James says, if you convert a believer, a brethren, somebody that's already a Christian, but they're backslidden, right? They've lost the salvation of their soul. If you convert them to serve God, you will save a soul. You cannot save a spirit. When the person that's a sinner becomes born again, at that moment, their spirit is saved. It's been translated from being in the kingdom of the devil to being in the kingdom of Christ, Colossians 1.13. It's born again. That spirit of the Christian is now resurrected. It is immortal, or if you like the term, glorified. Now, when a Christian backslides, in all of Christ's parables, the spirit remains glorified, but the soul becomes lost. Now, if you read this in his parable in Matthew 25, he gives three parables in Matthew 25. From verses 1 to 13, we read of the ten uh, virgins and five fools and five wise, but all in the kingdom. Now, the reason they're in the kingdom is because they're saved. You see, what Jesus taught to Nicodemus, you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born again. Well, those ten virgins are all in the kingdom. Now, five are fools because they're born again, but they walk in darkness. So they're not serving God. There's no oil in their lamp. They're walking a carnal life, a lifestyle of carnality. They're still a Christian. They're still in the kingdom. And if your denomination doesn't believe that, then you don't believe Christ. You don't believe the real gospel because you don't read metaphors. You're not reading your Bible metaphorically. So as you study the three parables in Matthew 25, he taught that from verses number 14 to 30, the parable of the talents, they were all in the kingdom. One man buried his talent. So you will get Christians that will not work for God. They live for themselves. They're carnal believers, but they are believers. They're in the kingdom. Now, if you don't like that, then I can't change the gospel. The parables are parallel truths. They teach the real gospel. And so we realize that as we study parables, we learn about the true gospel. For an example, Jesus said to his disciples one day, If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, Move, and it will move. So think about this. These are metaphors. Every one of us would like the faith of a mustard seed because if ever a mountain comes into our life like cancer, these are metaphors. If we deal with a mountain of cancer or a mountain of disease, or a mountain of a plague, or we're dealing with a mountain in our marriage, like divorce, the marriage is rocky. All right, we want to say to the mountain, move, we want it to obey us. We want it out of our lives, out of our relationships. But the only way you can do that is if you meet the condition. What is the condition? Christ said you must have the faith of a mustard seed. So how do we learn about mustard seed faith? It's taught in Matthew 13, verses 31 to 32. Now today, it's been so perverted. People think mustard seed faith, and they try and take something literal, like a real mustard seed that's very small, and then they talk about faith being that small. That's ridiculous. That is not the meaning of the mustard seed faith. Listen to the true interpretation of the mustard seed faith. Jesus said in metaphors, he said, a man took a seed, a mustard seed, which is the least of all seeds. He planted it in the earth. It died. It produced the greatest tree in the earth. When the mustard tree grew up and, and it grew many branches, the birds, the fowls of the air, lodged in the branches. So what did Christ say? First of all, he taught that the man was God the Father. This is the gospel, beloved. The Father would take the mustard seed. That's Jesus Christ. I want you to realize that under the name seed, 
If we study seed in the Bible, Jesus has many names as a seed. The word seed means human being. Now in Genesis 3.15, Jesus is the seed of the woman that would bruise Satan's head when he would die on cross or Calvary. So if we study again in Galatians 3.16, Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Or Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, or again repeat it in Romans 1.3, Jesus is the seed of David. See, and that's also stated all throughout the Bible. Jesus is the seed of David. So as the name seed, it means he's a human being. Now in his parable, he said the mustard seed is the least of all seeds, plural. So plurality, all human beings or the human race. Who is the most humblest? That's the word least. The most humblest or meekest man to ever walk this earth was the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody was as meek as Christ. Now Moses was a meek man. Job also. But they could not compare to Christ. He was the least of all human beings. The, the mustard seed. He is the most humblest. Nobody prayed like Jesus. Not my will. Thy will be done. So he emptied himself out and he did the will of the Father. Now in order for a Christian to have the faith of a mustard seed, they must stop doing their own will. They must do the will of God taught in the gospel. From Matthew to Revelation, there's the will. There's the covenant. There's the commandments. There is the doctrine. You read the will, you do the will, and now you're emptying yourself out and you're becoming least. You are decreasing. Christ is increasing. And now, with that type of faith, you can tell a devil to come out of somebody and a mountain will move. You can tell cancer to die and a mountain will move. If you submit to God, if you come under authority, God will give you authority. Now, there were two people in the Bible that figured out the greatest faith, the mustard seed faith. And we can talk about them. When we talk about the Roman centurion, he said to Jesus, don't come to my home. Just speak the word. He said, I am a man under authority. I say to a man, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. So what the man is saying is, because I'm under authority to Caesar, I've learned to obey the authority of the government. Therefore, Caesar gave me authority. So now, I've been given authority as the Roman soldier and a centurion. So I have soldiers under me. I tell him to go and he goes. In the spirit realm, he was saying to Jesus, Don't come to my home. Speak the word. Because if you tell a demon to leave, because you're under authority to God, the demon will leave. You've been given authority. He understood the greatest faith, the mustard seed faith, and how it operates. You know, there is a little woman who also understood the same thing. Jesus said to both of them, Great is your faith. I have not found so great faith in all Israel. You can think, you can think about that for a while, beloved. If you want mustard seed faith, come under authority, and you'll be given authority. Your ministry will grow. You'll be able to lay hands on the sick. They will recover. The raising of the dead is possible. Everything is possible with God when you're under authority, when you have mustard seed faith. Now, the entire book of Revelation is filled with metaphors. A lot of the sayings of Paul are filled with metaphors. If we had time to go into them, an example if we touch even Paul's teachings and metaphors, he taught that a woman represents a church and a man represents Christ. So that's a metaphor with a shadow typology. A man represents Christ, but the metaphor, a woman represents the church. Now, if you read that, if you understand it, it means that a woman must submit 
to her husband the way the church submits to Christ. Now, if we apply that in our churches today, and if we start to put women as pastors, what we're telling the world, metaphorically, is that Jesus is subject to the church instead of the church being subject to Christ because a woman represents the church. When you find, like I have found, the woman, the pastor is a woman, her husband is a deacon. So what they're saying is to the world, Christ is subject to the church instead of the church being subject to Christ. You think about that. The entire book of Revelation has so many metaphors. You'll never unravel this book without understanding metaphors. Now, as we study metaphors, metaphors begin with Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is filled with metaphors. His eyes is a flaming fire. His feet is burning brass. You know, you study the metaphors, and it will give you the understanding of the character of Christ. The metaphors reveal the character. An example, Jesus is called the Lamb of God in John 1, 29. It's a metaphor. Some people trying to read the Bible, because they don't read metaphorically, they do much damage to the gospel, and they do damage to people that listen to them. They pervert the Bible by reading a scripture like Genesis chapter 3. The serpent spoke to Eve. Now, they're reading a metaphor, and they're trying to interpret it literally. They're trying to say a real snake had the ability to talk. That's ridiculous. That is so ridiculous. That snake or serpent is only a metaphor to talk to you and I about the character of Satan. Satan's character is subtle and sly and deceptive like a serpent. That's his character. It's a metaphor for his character. It does not mean a serpent spoke to Eve. That would be ridiculous. Just the same thing as Jesus is called the Lamb of God. We don't say that Jesus has, has four legs and a woolly tail and two woolly ears. We don't talk about Jesus as a physical lamb. Why would we talk about a serpent as a physical serpent instead of the character of Satan? When people try to read what is a metaphor, literally they end up in a spirit of error and they pervert the gospel. So as we study the book of Revelation, you will find out the other character of Satan. Revelation 12, the serpent now becomes a dragon. Now, if we were to read about him in Job 40, 41, he's a Leviathan, which means a, a large serpent in water. Or we can read about him as a behemoth. Again, just metaphors to describe the devil. So this is his character. And in Revelation 12, the dragon draws with his tail one-third of the stars, metaphors for angels. So you will never be able to comprehend the true gospel without understanding metaphors. An example to the overcomer in Revelation. Jesus said, I will give you the morning star. Do you see the promise, beloved? It's a powerful blessing if you understand metaphors. A star in the Bible always means an angelic or a glorified body. It means you're going to get resurrected. But look at the condition. Do all Christians meet the condition? No, they do not. They're going to lose their salvation of their soul and body because they love this present evil world. Jesus said to the overcomer, you must learn how to overcome sin. Overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Overcome by the Spirit, the anointing of God. Overcome by using the Word of God. Overcome with your love. Overcome for the glory of God. And there are great and precious promises, the half you know not of. And God will give you the morning star. You'll get a glorified body. Just read Daniel 12, verse 2 and 3. It tells you the exact same thing. God's grace be with you, beloved. This is Dr. Lyle Lee. May the Lord help you to understand how to read a Bible in seven different ways. Amen and amen.